Hello, everybody. Ivana, who very kindly organized this meeting, along with Claire and others, just gave me that symbol signal from the back of the room. So very sorry, Ivana, for starting the meeting a bit late. But um, lovely to see you all here. Uh, for those of you who have not had the pleasure to meet yet, my name is Seb Crutch. I'm one of the psychologists here. Um, and uh, uh, Nikki Zimmerman, who will introduce herself and our speakers in a moment, and I are really pleased to welcome you um, for this joint carers meeting. Um, just had to start with one boring but important practicality. We're not expecting a fire alarm. Um, so if you do happen to, oh, maybe I'll try, there, there we go. go. Um, if you do happen to hear the fire alarm, the green sign, the green fire escape is just right here. And if you have any mobility or accessibility problems, just come and find one of the team members will be around if anything should happen. Um, so before lunch, rather than me giving you a list of names of people who may sound a bit familiar by email and other interactions you've had with rare dementia support. Before lunch, we'll bring some of the team up um, so you can be introduced to them and maybe chat to them um, over coffee and lunch and sandwiches if you'd like to. Um, but I thought it's just worth reminding us about who is in the room here today, who you are, because lots of you will have had experience of coming to the specific groups we run for people affected by particular conditions. Whereas this is uh, one of our joint carer meetings, everyone together. So there'll be some people in the room who have, um, who live, uh, who are supporting people living with disorders that affect behavior and personality, language, vision, um, or who have inherited conditions, um, either supporting someone um, who has the condition now or is at risk of developing the condition in the future. Um, I flagged that up just because, unlike some of our specific groups, there may be some elements of the discussion today which are really, really relevant for you and others less so, but we hope you'll, you'll just take what's useful for you. We're also very, very conscious that people come at different times through their um, experiences of uh, living with dementia, might be stri striving for a diagnosis that you need needs to be no needs to be made, have been living with this some, for some time, and there are also some people here um, whose loved ones have been right through their journey with dementia, um, but are here to share their experience um, from, from beyond for those of you who are still living that walk in that walk. Um, and we're very, very conscious of the fact that this may be a rare moment in your very busy lives where it, I wouldn't say, say it's a day off because it's probably not how anyone would choose voluntarily to spend their time, but it may be a moment out of an incredibly intense um, caring day-to-day uh, -day routine. Um, so we hope there are, this will provide a bit of a break, a bit of a moment to, to think, um, to perhaps hear about something that might be useful for you or that you've not tried or just a connection um, that can be made. But equally, we're very aware that you're going to be going back into those very busy uh, lives. And so if there's anything we can do um, to help you to take something that you've heard today or spoken to someone about today, and you can rely on us a bit more to help you push forward um, with that. We'd be only too pleased. A quick example is we've started over the past year a really nice partnership um, with a free legal advice service run from here at UCL. So this is student lawyers supervised by qualified solicitors who have been helping some of our membership uh, um, with practical issues, filling in forms, legal advice pertaining specifically to their type of dementia. But of course, it's a one thing to know that such a service exists, and a whole other thing to find the time in your busy days to fill out an inquiry form and tell people of the type of help you need. So from now on, the legal team will be here at every meeting, so they'll be here at lunchtime if you want to have an informal chat. And also Nikki and her team, who you'll hear about in a moment, are now really geared up to direct you straight through to finding the person who needs the support. Because we don't want something like filling in an inquiry form to be the barrier between you hearing about an interesting idea or some possible support that's available on a day like today, but then not having in the midst of the everyday the, the time and the space and the capacity and the headspace to actually make something of it. Um, so anything you hear, please do anything that you say to any, um, anyone in the team who you'll meet just before lunchtime. Just say it to us, and we are here to try and be proactively supporting you, not just waiting for your um, calls to come in to us. Nikki. We're not working. Oh, oops, oh, sorry. There we go. Right. 
Um, well, before I go through the agenda, um, I hope I've met most of you before because you've come to a lot of the groups and I started um, in January. Um, to do a bit more support with the groups here and I spoke to Seb and said we need more support, we need to be more proactive. So um, we've got a whole support team now, the two beautiful, very glamorous and very young ladies that you met downstairs, Claire and Olivia, are now part of the support team. And so we are available by telephone and email to answer any of your queries and help with your day-to-day -day life, help navigate through those maze of health and social care pathways or look for some activities for you locally. Anything that you think might be a silly question isn't. And I do get lots of emails from people that start with, I'm really sorry to bother you. Well, don't be sorry. Please contact us and please do let us help you to make sort of life a little bit easier for you out there. So um, as Seb said, we are going to be um, having a whole parade of us later before lunch. Um, hopefully it won't put you off your lunch, um, but you, so you will know who is um, who's who and what we, what we all do. Um, so as the agenda here, um, I'm really, really pleased that we've got Jackie um, here to talk to you today. I've had the pleasure of knowing Jackie for many years now, and um, I think it's really important that she's come along and what she's got to say for you today. Um, and then afterwards, we're going straight on to our next talk um, with Alexis and Matt, um, who both I know very well as well. So I think they've got some really important information and tips for you today. Um, and then once that's finished, we'll have our parade and um, get some more information for you and let you know what's going on in the afternoon, which will be the small di discussions. So we've got lots of little tables out the back. Ah, ha, ha. <laughs> we've got uh, yeah five little tables out the back, and we were um, having Katrina from the UCL legal team here, and she'll be available for a chat with anybody and tell you about the services they do for the legal team. Myself and Claire will be talking to people about person-centred approaches. Seb will be around to do some clinical questions and answers. We've got, we're very lucky to have a couple of members from the research and clinical trials team who will be coming at lunchtime, but they'll be available from one o'clock to answer any questions and to talk to people about the opportunities um, involved, to get involved with research at Queen's Square. And Anna, who is a um, speech and language therapist who's just started working with us at um, Rare Dementia Support and at UCL, she's in the clinics as well. She's going to be here with Chris, um, who many of you know from the PPA group, to talk about speech and communication. So we've got quite a varied and full day. This afternoon we hope to run the sessions for half an hour at a time. So. Um, do have a think about what sessions you would like to attend because obviously you, you'll only have enough time to, to, uh, to visit two of the tables. Um, but I will hand over to Jackie now um, and um, hopefully you'll have a great day and enjoy Jackie's speech. Jackie, I think okay. you just need to scroll down, roll it down. Okay. Coping with change and challenge. Um, I nearly didn't make it this morning because I had a spectacular challenge um, when I went in to uh, see how my husband was. Um, I won't go into the details, but he was not as I would wish to find him. And uh, I think that that's sort of indicative of the kind of scale of the way in which you could be knocked off your perch quite suddenly <laughs> by things that happen when you're caring. Fortunately... Um, we had a, I had a carer come in for an hour who helped me clean Tony up and sort him out. And I'm hoping that my phone doesn't go off while I'm speaking because I'm a little bit worried because I think a change of medications had an unfortunate effect on him. Um, so you never know what's around the corner. And uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, this morning. Um, start off getting to know you. I know that you are all here because you have got the golden ticket of uh, being affected by a rare dementia. Now, my family was not affected by a rare dementia. Tony's dementia is plain old Alzheimer's, except it's young onset Alzheimer's, which is a little bit rarer. And um, I think at the last count, there's something like 42,000 people with young onset. Tony's symptoms, in retrospect, appeared when he was about 50, but he was not diagnosed until he was 60. Um, so it is slightly unusual. Um, and there's that moment when you feel like a complete freak when something like this affects you because 
uh, you know, rare dementias or young onset dementia. Um, it comes out of the blue, really, and uh, it's not something that people are desperately familiar with. Um, Seb gave me a bit of an idea. Is there anybody here who's sort of relatively recently diagnosed? You're, 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 yeah, okay, so, so there's some relatively recent, and then sort of maybe two to three, four, five years down the road? Okay, quite a lot in the mid-phase, 10 years or so. Okay, good, so we've got a great spread here. So apologies for those of you who have um, been living with this for sort of 10 years or so, because I'm sure that in many ways what I'm going to say is sort of teaching granny to suck eggs and all of that. But um, let's meet the family. If you can see that, um, here we are. Um, my two sons, Sam and Ben, Ben's girlfriend, Jen, me and Tony, and then on the right, uh, my daughter-in-law for five weeks now, Nam. So we're lucky. Um, we're a tight-knit family, and that's made a difference in terms of what's happened to us over the last few years. But I think it helps to sort of have a sense of who it is that we're talking about and so on. And you've known us for quite a long time, haven't you, Nick? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sort of seen us. Um, so... Um, Family context obviously is very, very important, and I'm, you know, fully aware that in having a family that are nearby and very involved with Tony's care makes a massive difference. I couldn't be here today except for the fact that Ben, who's sitting next to me there, works at home and he's he's with his father today. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to step out of the door. Um, right, let's move on a little bit. Tony was diagnosed in 2010, but as I've said. Um, it was 2006 when he first went to the doctor and said that he was concerned that he was forgetting things. Um, we subsequently had a mighty row about that because he forgot that he'd been to the doctor and said that he was forgetting things. And when I said that he had, then he got very angry with me. And so um, we had those sort of strange things going on. When you, when you look at the books and the literature, um, there tends to be, you know, these sort of maps. I, I hate the, I hate this terminology about journey. I said to Jeremy Isaacs at St George's, who diagnosed Tony, that you know, you sold us a ticket on a journey we didn't want to go on. And I, I you know, journeys should be exciting. They should be fun. You should be going somewhere you're looking forward to see. I'm, I'm really very against this idea of the dementia journey. But hey, um, but if we think about the stages, sort of typically in the literature and in the pamphlets that you get, there's a sort of pre-diagnosis when you're a bit worried about what's going on. And then there's a stage, you know, where there's sort of no impairment particularly, but things don't seem to be quite right. Then you get mild cognitive impairment, and then it moves on, and then you go through mid-stage, severe, and late stage, and so on. And it's always portrayed as being a kind of a descent down an escalator, isn't it? That you sort of step along at the top, and you glide along for a bit, and then you start going down. Um, you know, as you know, your scores on the MMSE drop off and all the rest of it. Um, I suppose my message this morning, if I've got a message, is that life isn't quite like that. Um, and it's a lot messier than that um, when you actually live it. I mean, looking back over the last few years of our experience, I regard the period from 2006 to 2010 when Tony was diagnosed as actually being the worst. He was, not, he was not desperately cognitively impaired then, but he was behaving a completely irrational way. He was um, struggling to cope with work. He was in a very high-powered work environment. He was a barrister. Um, he wasn't coping at all. Um, his personality changed dramatically. And in all sorts of ways that I won't go into here, um, life was chaotic. So when we got to the point of diagnosis, that was a relief. Um, you know, I'll, I'll never forget the afternoon of June the 2nd, 2010. Um, and, and what Dr. Isaac said to Tony was this. He said, you know, we've been through all of these tests. In my opinion, 
you have Alzheimer's disease. It is progressive, it is incurable, and you need to go away from here thinking about the options for your future care. Now, when I say that to people, quite often people go, <gasps> isn't that a bit brutal? Actually, it was exactly what we needed to hear. When you've been in a state of chaos, uncertainty, looking for answers, that hearing that message um, was actually in a bizarre kind of way, positive. I said to Tony, how do you feel? And he said, I feel relieved. And I said, why? And he said, because I know I'm not going mad. He knew what the reason was. And so I think that, um, you know, obviously people's experience of, of the moment of diagnosis varies enormously. And I, everything that I say today is, you know, from the personal perspective of, of me as an individual and, and of my family and of, of Tony, um, I know that a lot of other people have had a different issue, which is that whole one of denial, where people get very um, you know, resistant to the idea that there is anything wrong. I think in Tony's case, he knew actually in the back of his mind that there was something wrong, and he welcomed knowing what it was. So, again, you know, sort of things aren't sort of quite as smooth as they are in... in you know, sometimes in the analysis. So looking for answers, and so then we had our answer, um, and though it wasn't um, a great answer, um, we moved into phase two, and just sort of thinking about this, and I think that those early days of living with dementia, it was about adapting to, to change realities, as I've said. I mean, I'm very interested in um, Seb talking about, you know, this, the legal team who are going to be here and things. One of the things that happens when you're diagnosed is that you're thrown into this whirlwind of emotion. You're thinking, you know, what on earth's going to become of us? How are we going to cope with this and everything else? But you can't actually address all that emotional stuff because over here is a mountain of paperwork and it's to do with filling in LPAs. Is he compass mentis to write a will? Um, we'd never had any particular dealings with the benefit system other than child benefit, I suppose. Sort of suddenly he was without, a, he was <clears throat> without at work, we had no visible means of income. There was a whole lot of stuff, practicalities that we had to deal with. Um, now, if as reasonably sort of intelligent, well-educated you know, sort of copers, we were finding it difficult. I really, really wonder how some families manage to cope with it because it is massively, massively difficult at a time when you're being torn in all kinds of things. I mean, I, I know um, filling in the application for um, PIP and for, uh, it's all changed now, isn't it? It was disability living allowance and things. I couldn't fill that form in because it's 60 pages of sitting down, writing about what it is that your husband can't do anymore. And it's a very, very emotionally difficult, you know, I would do a page of it and I'd end up in floods of tears and put it on one side. It took me six months to fill in the form. So you're adapting to these family relationships, stopping work suddenly. Um, again, with the, with the young onset dementias, um, a, a lot of the sort of thinking and the writing around dementia is, is based on a model where it's sort of people who are post working lives and, and so on and so forth. Where, and if you're already retired, um, it's not such a major lifestyle change. If one day you're appearing in court trying to defend somebody and the next day you're told that actually you haven't got the mental capacity to do it, the change is absolutely dramatic. It was traumatic for Tony. He went for several years with the idea that he'd been sacked from work, that he'd been um, disrobed or whatever it is they do to barristers, <laughs> um, you know, that, that, he'd, that he'd finished his working life un, under a shadow, which, which, which was terrible. You know, he'd been successful, he'd worked hard, he'd done everything right. But it was really, really traumatic for him. He, um, He found that very, very difficult. And then there's trying to keep things normal. Alongside all of that, we did sort of say, well, let's have some fun. Let's do some of the things that we might have done. And so we kind of, 
in a, in a relatively short time, we went to Australia, we went to Mexico, we went to Iceland. You know, we sort of packed in a few of the things that um, might have been on the bucket list. Um, I'm surprised now sometimes sort of how risky it was in retrospect, um, but it was certainly massively worth doing. And so alongside all this dreadful stuff, you know, there's some good memories from that time and, 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 and so on. So this business of um, that phase of, of, of adapting was a very mixed bag. Um, one of the things that really helped us there was um, at that point, we set up this St George's Young Onset Dementia Support Group, and Nikki was very involved in that at the time. But um, there was a bunch of us who sort of said, well, let's get together and do things. And, and we did actually have some fun together. Learning with and from each other was the best thing. And I'm, I know that you will be finding that in the groups that you attend here, that there's nothing like the lived experience of other families. I mean, the St George's group, Elaine, you know, was also massively involved in that. We covered about six or seven boroughs, didn't we? And so people would say, oh, you can't do this. And we say, absolutely, yes, you can, because we know that, you know, Wandsworth does this differently from how Merton does and so on. So it made us powerful, the fact that we were talking to each other and that we knew what was going on. And we did some sort of fun. We had some activities together. And we talked to each other. I mean, we had sort of lively email trails about coping with things like feeding and continence and, you know, all of that, as well as some emotional support. That was really invaluable at that time. Um, <clears throat> I'm getting worried about the time, but I'll keep racketing through. Um, phase three, I sort of call this, you know, the sort of the phase of living in a fog, when it began to become, it, 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 Tony's dementia began to impact on him more. And then there was a whole new set of things, which is how to fill the time post-work. You can't always be going on holidays and trips and travel and so on. And so you've got a fit, active, healthy guy who actually can't be left by himself for very long because he had some quite sort of interesting ways of filling the time. Um, I was once putting a load of washing in and having a shower and came down and found that he'd set about dismantling the kitchen, taking all the cupboard doors off. And I said, why are we doing this? And he said, because I think we're moving. And, I, and so these were glazed doors and they were all hanging off on one screw. So it was kind of enterprising but dangerous. Um, at that point also, Tony had a very strong sense of loss and anger and fear. And um, he was frustrated at the idea that he needed help from others. Um, he was bored. He all, you know, his motto was Tony's don't do bored. And then suddenly all of the things that had kept him from being bored were no longer available to him or no longer engaged him in the same way. Um, there was this whole business about loss of work, which impacted on him massively. And, and at that point, I can remember very, very disturbed nights. And what he was doing in the night was roaming around the bedroom, getting ready for work. And he would be digging out his work suit. He'd be looking for his wig and gown. And at four and five in the morning, he'd be tearing his hair out in anguish because he hadn't prepared his brief for next day. And he was in a really, really dreadful state about it. And I spent ages sort of saying, love, you know, you remember you haven't been at work for a year or two now. You know, you've had this diagnosis. You know, you've, you, you didn't get the sack and so on and so forth. And it just made him more and more anguish. One day, I had a breakthrough, or one night, it was about five o'clock in the morning, and he was struggling around trying to climb into his work clothes. And I went out of the room, and I sat on the landing for 20 minutes. And I went back in, and he said, it's, I said, it's OK. I've phoned Chambers. I've told them that you've got flu. You're on a sickie. You have a duvet day. And he said, oh, thank God. And he got back into bed. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, <laughs> sort of sometimes a little light flicks, you know, and sort of suddenly you sort of realise... There's a way, and there's a whole thing here about ethics, you know, I mean, you know, people have very often tell me that, you know, one of the sort of tenets of, of dementia care is, is truth and honesty, and, you know, we shouldn't lie to our partners, our loved ones, and so on. My answer to that is that my ethics say, if it's in Tony's best interests, then I will tell him what he needs to hear. 
end of. Yeah. So you know, I, I, you know, there was a, there was another thing. He had a sending order to UNICEF. He used to send sub, you, he, he, he to support UNICEF. And you know how they send you letters with sort of pictures of starving children and so on and so forth, and encourage you to send them more money and so on and so forth. He used to get these letters, and he was in absolute distress. He thought he read them as being an invitation to go to sub-Saharan Africa and join in some project out there. So. You know, I started tearing up his mail. Sorry, unethical, but I, you know, it's better than having him driven mad. Um, so, he, he, this was a stage where he had some quite severe delusions. Another delusion that he had, which was massively distra distressing for him, was the fact that his parents had abandoned him, and he couldn't understand why they'd gone. I mean, they were, they were both of them dead 20 years. Um, you know, so he spent a lot of time looking for his mum and dad, which again was was quite hard to manage. Um, and sad, and I used to talk to him and say, I, I, rather than saying, don't be silly, you, you know, you, your mum died 20 years ago, I just used to talk to him about what a lovely mum she was, and about how his dad, and about how he looked after them, and so on and so forth, and just gently, gently sort of bring it round to the fact that maybe they were old and hadn't been around for a little bit, so rather than sort of saying they are dead, um, you know, he kind of moved to a state where he felt more peaceful about it. Um, this, this is a photograph which I he was sort of popped up in other contexts, but this is Tony's bedside table, and this is, uh, it, this, is, this is... One day he stood in the kitchen, he said to me, I don't know how the world works anymore. And, and this, is, this is the last time Tony ever made me a cup of tea. One morning he said, do you want a cup of tea? And I said, that would be nice. And he disappeared for a long time, and he came back. And um, I just took the picture because I think it just sort of so captures, you know, a mind which is being disrupted. So he's got some very strong sense of what the ingredients are of a cup of tea, a vessel, a tea bag, the milk's all there and everything, but just not quite made it and so on. And his watches are there. He, he, he's, the, during this period, he constantly needed to know what time it was, and he would wear two or three wristwatch on either, on either arm. It was almost this sort of sense of trying to ground himself in, in space and time. Sort of sums it up in a way. Um, so, we move on. Um, I'll jump on. What made a difference? Meeting others in saying... Discovering new skills and talents. Now, some of you, I'm sure, have read, have read that book, Contented Dementia. Um, and I know it's a bit controversial, and there's this sort of whole idea, isn't there, about locating people in the realities that they used to that they used to have my my objection to that as a philosophy is is that it kind of wipes out the idea that people with dementia can learn new things and we had a very very strange experience with tony um tony was a man who had never ever so much as doodled in in his life i you know we'd been married 43 years i had never seen him you know, so much as pick up a pencil and sketch a cat. We, we started going to the Royal Academy to the In Mind sessions, and one day they gave out some paper and pencils, and he said, I can't do this, I can't draw. We went home, I said, are you sure? I got out some of my art bits and pieces. And he started painting. And this was a man who was totally books, it was about words, it was about language, it was about logic. If you're a barrister, things are very black and white in the world. You're either right or you're wrong, you're guilty or you're innocent. Being an artist and all of that sensibility, he hadn't really engaged with that at all. He started to paint. Um, as, you, as you can see, bold, sort of abstract expressionist type paintings. There was a period from um, of, of three or four years, from sort of 12, 13, when he reinvented himself as an artist. And that's what he did. That became his work. Um, in this picture, you can see he didn't have a studio, but he set his easel up in, in the kitchen. And he used to come down in the morning, and he used to get his palette out, and he used to paint, and he painted a lot. Um, and and uh, to the extent that um, his work was exhibited, the Royal Academy had a big um, event, which was for supporters of the Alzheimer's Society. And they asked if they could display Tony's work, and they came and they chose ten of his pieces, and they put them up in the fine rooms at the, at the Royal Academy. I was in bits, can you imagine? Um, 
they said, do you want to come and see? And they took me up and showed me the room, and I just fell apart, and I was sobbing. And uh, they said, um, you disappointed? I said, no, I'm not disappointed. You know, I mean, the idea that Tony would be exhibiting at the Royal Academy was going to be on dreams. Um, and he was actually offered, I mean, a, a serious art collector offered us serious money for some of his paintings. We didn't sell them. There were some things you can't put a price on. Um, so I'm not suggesting that this would happen to, to everybody, but I mean, some of the things that um, people in the St George's group and others have enjoyed, positive spin, cycling on Clapham Common, especially adapted by Dill, Song Haven, some of you know, singing for the brain. Do any, do any of you are singing for the brain? I took Tony for singing for the brain, and about 20 minutes in, he said, could he go to the loo? And when I, he, he went off to the loo and he didn't come back for a bit and I went and I found him climbing out of the kitchen window at St George's Church Hall. He was half in and out and I hauled him back in and he said if I ever took him there again he was going to kill me. <laughs> so, so, singing for the bre I, I mean, I suppose the point I would say is that if you didn't like community singing before you had dementia, there's no particular reason why you'd like it after you had dementia. So, it's, you know, it's really horses for courses, isn't it? And but there's probably something. Um, but don't make assumptions about what that thing might be. Um, there's all sorts of relaxed performances, gallery visits, walking. Um, at the moment, in the stage that he's at the moment, Tony is having um, some yoga and shiatsu massage, which is wonderful for him because he enjoys it, he, he calms him. But it's also, for me, as his carer makes a difference because he's much more mobile it's easier to dress him and so on and so forth because he's got a degree of mobility that he was beginning to use and as I say there was this sort of idea of in mind a new identity as an artist so some good things happened around this time as well now um, in phase four I characterize this as learning to accept help from others my mum was an enormous help to me she died in 2015. <coughs> One of the things she said to me before she died, she said, you are not going to be able to do this by yourself. Tony has got to learn to accept help from others. And I know this is a major, major thing for people. And that every one of you in this room and your partners or whoever it is that you're looking after will have a strong sense of independence. Nobody likes the idea of being looked after. But um, it, you need to accept it. And if you can accept it, then it makes life easier. I know it's not easy to find appropriate support. It's not easy to find appropriate support for young onset dementias. And I know that for some of the, the rarer forms of dementia that you're coping with, that it's also difficult because it manifests itself in different ways and sometimes behaviours are difficult and so on and so forth. So that's a bit of thing. Provision varies from place to place, area to area. Above all, it needs to be flexible. This sort of idea of one size fits all, this is what we offer, take it or leave it. You need to be able, I mean, I know there's a huge issue about social funding and who pays for dementia care and so on and so forth. Like many of you in this room, we're self-funders. You know, it's horrible. I think over time, for the very little amount of care that we've, uh, of support that we've had, I did the sum, it's about £100,000 over time already for not very much. But being a self-funder means that you have choice, you know, in the sense that you can sort of choose to buy that and not that. You, you're not sort of forced into whatever social services point you're at. And the, as you say, the idea of support challenges beliefs about... So there's, a, there's sort of a lot of negative and problematic things about this. But um, what I've discovered is, first, first of all, it stops carers from going balmy. Um, it creeps up on you. It creeps up on you being a carer. And, uh, you know, you get yourself into a mindset where you feel other and apart from the rest of the world. That, you know, other people do things that are no longer available to you because of, because of where it is. But the, the thing that I discovered very rapidly was that Tony is very capable of establishing new relationships and friendships with other people. He gets on well with other people. One of the things that I found that when I went to sort of different care settings, day centre or residential place for respite and so on and so forth, you look at the other people there and they all seem much older than Tony, they're all in their 80s, but look at the staff, the staff are young, 
and there's quite often young guys around there sort of doing the maintenance or, or whatever and so on and so forth. Tony made friends with those people. When I say, you know, I, I mean, at the moment, he goes to day centre two days a week. Um, just in the last two weeks, I've had somebody coming in in the morning um, to help me get him up and dress him and start the day. So, so that's it. I mean, it's about, what's that? Two sixes a 12... About 15 hours a week. So the other, the remainder of the 168, I'm with him. But he does benefit from those other contacts and from those other things. And, and you know, he makes jokes and he, li he likes seeing other people. Good support makes time for more, for the pleasurable things. And uh, <laughs> good care, the, the well being of everybody involved. So the story goes on. I suppose if you looked at Tony now, you'd say that he's in sort of severe stroke late stages of his dementia. One of the problems with dementia is that unlike cancers, that the prognosis is so very open-ended. You know, if you've got a stage four cancer, tragically, you know that you've got, you know, a year, maybe 18 months or whatever, if, if the treatment doesn't work. With, with, with dementia, it's not like that. And so... You don't know how long your resources, physical, mental, financial, and everything are going to have to last. Um, but in telling our story, I hope what I've said is that it's not this sort of smooth descent, that there have been ups and downs. In actual fact, Tony at the moment, I would say, is, is actually in a better place than he was now, um, than he was... At, at, in the years immediately after his diagnosis. He's actually in a kind of quite happy, blissed out sort of state. He laughs a lot. He talks to people. We can't often make, you know, make enormous sense of what he says, but he, co he communicates. Um, he certainly has a quality of life. Um, he's, he's scored zero on the you know, MMSE for the last three or four years now. So... The picture is that um, you know things sometimes do go better, do sort of feel better almost, and I know that seems strange. Um, and and I've been talking to Seb and Emma about some of the work that they're doing around sort of mapping these changes. I'm avoiding the word of journey because sometimes I think that just taking a snapshot of the moment and saying where am I now can actually sort of help you focus more sharply on what your needs are and on the needs of the person. And they're not always sort of quite as obvious as is represented by this idea of sort of things going from good to bad to worse. I think that's about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jackie, for that wise words indeed. And um, I think it's probably something that you can all sort of resonate with here today. I'm going to swiftly on now to invite Alexis and Matthew to come up and talk about SOS Happens. Thank you. Uh, is it this? Okay. Yes. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexis Sobrano. I work for the Dementia Care Service at Sweet Tree Home Care. Good morning, everybody. My name is Matthew Mills, and I also work for Sweet Tree Home Care, and I'm the Director of General Home Care and Dementia Service. Okay, so today we're going to talk a bit about emergency preparedness and emergency planning. I think um, what Jackie said about you never really know what's around the corner um, really stuck in my mind. So for us, it's about being prepared, so you can't predict what's going to happen, but being prepared often is half the battle and allows you to use your energies elsewhere. <laughs> Okay, so uh, first we'd like to ask if anybody knows where the uh, medical ID and emergency area of your phone is. So any iPhone users here? Can you just raise your hand? Okay, and how many people know where to find how to set up your medical ID? One person. Not great odds. <laughs> okay. Great start. <laughs> so, um, so something really simple that you can do and that's actionable now, um, especially if you want to tune us out if we're getting a bit boring. So if you go, um, if you have an iPhone, if you go into where the step counter is, there's a little heart icon on your phone. 
you scroll down to the bottom and you can set up your medical ID and you can tell your phone how to react in emergency. So for me, I have one of the side buttons. If I double click it, it calls my emergency contact right away. Um, and so there have been times where my sister has gotten unfortunate phone calls with my phone in my bag, but <laughs> she knows I'm fine. So you have to set, kind of set it up how it works for you, but something that's really useful. Um, and I'll tell you a little quick anecdotal story. Um, my sister and her friend, very fit marathon runners. They were offered places um, to run in the New York City Brooklyn half marathon. They took bibs from other girls who couldn't run. So those bib numbers were signed up with somebody else's name and contact information. Um, mile 12, my sister's friend, very fit, she fainted, um, she overheated, and the information on the bib when the medical team got to her didn't match who she actually was. Um, so what the medical staff did was took her finger, unlocked her iPhone, went to her medical ID, and started calling the emergency contacts in her medical list. Um, so it was really, really useful, and just telling that story because no matter how healthy you are, things happen um, at any moment in time, and this is something, this is a piece of technology that's I think being used quite regularly um, with emergency personnel. So they knew that they could take her phone, unlock her iPhone, and get information. So really useful. And we can help anybody set that up if you want afterwards, if, if you can't find it. Well, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Technology, no. Okay. So I um, wanted to keep it really concise in 10 steps, 10 steps excuse me, to safety planning. So uh, the ones in bold here are ones that we'll focus on in the presentation today. So uh, first step, getting an assessment and a home safety assessment. So um, how many people here have had a comprehensive care assessment done? Okay, not too many. Okay, so um, the, co the personal assessment is really about uh, the individual's care needs their emotional needs, social needs, and putting together together a very thorough plan of what that looks like now and then how we can plan for any future needs. So incredibly important. The home safety assessment is more about making sure that the home is safe at this point and then to, again to start thinking and planning about as, as your loved one's needs change, what do we need to look at at adapting in the house to make it a safe environment and really to promote independence. So if we can adapt along with changing needs, you can give someone a better chance of staying independent longer and perhaps avoiding a lot of those feelings of loss um, and loss of independence that, that they would otherwise. Exploring home care options. So uh, we will chat a bit about the different home care options that are out there creating an emergency contact form. Now, I know, excuse me for a couple of you who have seen this presentation before, um, but we're gonna go through an emergency contact form that you can use to have a list of really important information that you can give out to other professionals, family members, neighbors. Completing advanced directives, um, that's something like the lasting power of attorney forms, very important to have any um, advanced directives for care and treatment. Some. Some people like to say in advance what they would and wouldn't want. Um, and I know they're really tough conversations to have, but very important nonetheless, because that also relieves a lot of that last minute, that last minute decision making if somebody does become unwell. Enrolling in a personal alarm and exploring telecare, we will get into detail about what really cool telecare and technology pieces are out there that you can utilize and that you can ask your, your GP to refer you to a, a local telecare team to get a thorough assessment. Securing community medical care, so looking at what specialists you meet, may need to make contact with. Um, securing refills, so how much prescription do you have in stock if there was an emergency or if you couldn't run out to get it the day you're supposed to pick up that new week's worth of prescription, do you have a, a buffer to cover any unforeseen emergencies? Preparing a go bag, um, we'll get into detail about that. Ordering any equipment needed, so any medical equipment such as Zimmer frames, walking sticks, wheelchairs and arranging any follow-up medical appointments. So um, I'm often surprised at how many follow-up appointments aren't arranged quickly, um, and it's just thinking about the next steps and any appointments after you've seen your specialist. So um, I will talk first about the emergency contact form. So this is something that can be utilized um, freely as you like, and there are emergency contact forms, blank ones in the back on one of the tables. So it's really putting down someone's name, address, phone number, basic 
information, a primary emergency contact, secondary emergency contact, if you have a care manager involved, their information as well, GP, preferred hospital, pharmacy, any insurance that um, you have outside of NHS, medical history, and then allergies, very important, any special instructions on somebody's diet, so if they have any swallowing issues, a wander risk, any advanced directive orders, date of birth, medication list, and then any immunizations that they've had in the recent year. So what I suggest for the emergency contact form is that you give it to anybody who needs to know this information. If your loved one goes to a day center or an activity center, giving it to the GP. If you have to go to the hospital, give, making sure the hospital has a copy of this. Um, I know some people have given it out to neighbors just in case they're able to help as well. Okay, and, and on the back of the emergency contact form are other important contacts. So if you, have, if you have a physiotherapist involved, a speech and language therapist, any other important contacts in the context of you and your loved one's care. Okay. Any questions about that? No? Okay. Okay. So home care options. Um, when you're looking at sort of home care and, and care in general, this can be very new to someone. And for someone who's, as Jackie said, looking to, to get help for the first time, this can be a bit of a minefield. Um, but in terms of home care and domiciliary care, um, there's sort of three main parts to it, which you'll probably look at when you start investigating um, sort of your options. So you've got sort of privately hired care. And this is where you're sort of in charge, so you have the most sort of control over this kind of this kind of care. But you are the employer, so you then have the responsibility of employing that person. Um, so this is sort of private carers coming into your home, supporting the, the, the individual needed to. Um, and then with that, so there's you're responsible for the training, you're responsible for making sure that person turns up. If they don't turn up, then you've got issues with that. But you can obviously pick that person, so you've got responsibility over who is supporting in your own home. Um, and there's no regulations with privately hired carers, so they aren't don't come under CQC. So although that carer might be brilliant, um, they might not have the, the right insurances and, and those kind of bits and pieces. So you have to really have the responsibility of that. Um, and then there's moving on to sort of the council help, and as we kind of said, this only comes in if you're under the, the certain funding. So this might not apply for everybody. Um, and this is a different way of, of doing it. This is very much a, a more of a task orientated method of support. Um, and, and with that, the visits are generally quite short. Um, you have very little choice about who the support worker could be, and very little choice sometimes about what time that person could come into your home. Um, but you have that support there and you have some structure. Um, so there is some positives to that as well. And then you have a private agency. Um, and with the private agency, they are responsible. They have to take sort of the understanding and, and the liability of that individual who's coming into your home. Um, and with that, you can still choose who, who comes in. You can still, still choose your support worker and make sure they're the right fit for what you need. Um, but then there's that support of the regular assessments and the monitoring and the CQC and all that around that. So there's, there's, it is a bit of a minefield. Um, there's a lot to think about, but sometimes um, you've got to look at what can, what's cost effective, but also what's most suitable. Um, so a private agency probably is one of the most expensive sort of, sort of options here, but it could be one of the safest. Um, so there's different options for everything. Any questions on that bit? And then moving on to sort of the telecare, which we briefly spoke about earlier. So there is so much out there at the moment, um, sometimes too much option, and you get a bit confused what, what can help. So it's difficult to see that sort of that image up there, but there's loads of different things, flood detectors, bed exit monitors, fall detectors, loads of things which you can put in your home. So therefore you're sort of you can balance against sort of personal one-to-one -one support and the telecare support with that. Um, this little bit around the bottom here is called an Apple Lock, um, and that's through, through, through Apple, and they've got different um, apps from different companies, and basically you can op open a lock door through an app. Um, so that can be very positive in terms of if that individual is at home, if that's someone who you're not there for, if you're at work and you've got issues to lock and open the door and those kind of bits. So this kind of stuff is to help you 
um, feel more positive about not being there all the time, not having someone around all the time. And then everyone see this on the adverts in terms of the doorbell. Um, ring the doorbell, person's face shows up on your phone, those kind of bits and pieces. So the technology out there is, is loads. Um, is there anything, you're quite good on technology, Alexis, is yeah, there any more? Um, so I, something that I, I found quite helpful was the GPS um, locator that goes in the shoe sole. So that kind of eliminates, did they leave the key at home? Is the purse at home? If you can have a couple of pairs of shoes or even one pair of shoes that's accessible that your loved one wears consistently, if you put that in, unless they take their shoes off outside, um, you're going to know where they are. And so that's something that perhaps will work better for some people rather than having something in a purse again or on a keychain. And then um, with the other sensors that are about um, the flood detector, really useful people tend to start putting funny things down the toilet or forget the waters on, so that will sense the water's overflowing and, and put an alert through so you can get to that quickly. Um, with the fall detector, quite, I think that's quite self-explanatory. So if somebody has a fall, that will send an alert. Um, the smoke alarm, I think it's important sometimes to have a smart smoke alarm. So rather than something that just says a noise or, or does a noise, it actually says what's going on or it alerts another person so that they can react because somebody with dementia might not connect the noise to the, um, the fire or the smoke that, that is potentially around. And um, let's see, anything else that's not self-explanatory? Um, the PIR, so the PIR sensor really tells you where somebody is in the house. And you can also connect that to um, a motion censored light that comes on very gradually. So if somebody gets up to use the bathroom in the night, it'll turn a light on very gently rather than shocking someone awake. Um, and actually, I think statistically falls tend to happen with people going to the bathroom overnight. Um, so that that is quite helpful as well. Um, so again, happy to answer any questions about the telecare that's up here if you have any questions about that after. Um, the, the, actually the heat detector as well, I will say that is very useful. Sometimes people tend to fiddle with the temperature controls in the house and it can get very hot and then you're putting somebody at risk of potentially becoming dehydrated if it's very hot in the house. So, um, just being aware of what's going on in the environment of the house can be very useful. I said that you're about technology. I don't do technology. <laughs> Um, but then we've got go bags. This is moving into more of the hospital style. So if, if as, as we may all know, unfortunately, in and out hospital was quite a frequent thing to, to some people's lives. Um, and it's about preparing. So this seems quite simple. Um, it feels like something that you would probably think about, but you don't always because there's lots of things to think about. So this is, this is simply about preparing a go bag. So this is like what you would take to the hospital, having something ready, maybe a small bag in the car, maybe a small bag at home, because you never know when you may have to go somewhere which you weren't planning to. Um, and this is very similar to sort of think about having a baby, for example, and I know too well about that. I've got a 10 week old at home. So having a bag in the front of the, in the car and a bag in the hallway was quite frequent recently. Um, so those bits and pieces in there got the emergency contact form, which Alexa said about earlier, your basic personal information, change of clothing, those kind of bits and pieces. Um, and obviously there's the knots in there as well. So large amounts of cash, jewellery, those kind of things. And not always things that you think about. It's not always things that you want to think about. But once it's done, it's done, put on the side, that's all sorted. So if we move on to, yeah, and you can crack on with this. Okay. Um, so, so what we wanted to speak about a bit in correlation with that go bag is what to look out for that your your family member. Yes, yes. Are there copies of this handout? Because I can't see that. Thing. Okay. Um, this. Yeah, we'll, we'll send. Yeah, we can we'll send, send them out. Okay. Yeah, it, this one has a lot of information, and for me, it's the takeaway of uh, the differences between dementia, delirium, and depression. Um, so just, I don't want to bore you, so it, is anybody very familiar with delirium? No. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's very important to talk about yes, okay, great. And that's why we have it up here today. So um, delirium is an acute and severe change to somebody's mental capacity. So that is something that happens quite rapidly. 
and it can be either a hyperactive delirium or a hypoactive delirium. So any sudden change in your loved one's ability to think and react should alert you that something something deeper is going on. So delirium is a medical issue. It's something that me, needs to be looked into ASAP because if, if allowed to evolve, the person can get very, very sick very quickly. So delirium is typically caused by things like an infection, medication interactions, and even sometimes a change of environment. So actually people who have dementia experience about 30 to 40 percent higher instances of delirium in the hospital. So just being in that chaotic, unfamiliar environment can elicit a, the delirium in, in an individual. So again, rapid onset, it's altered levels of consciousness, arousal, and cognition. For hypoactive delirium, you tend to see somebody who's a bit more lethargic and non-responsive. So if you're seeing this very suddenly in your loved one, you, again, you have to think something else is going on. So it's very, very distinctly different from dementia, as, as I'm sure everybody's aware that dementia is quite stable. Sure, there are some ups and downs, but you can more or less predict how somebody's going to be on a given day. This would be a severe change in, in the way that they're relating to you and the environment. Um, so if you see your loved one change, for me, the key takeaway is to check it out immediately. A urine sample, have the GP over, um, have bloods taken because something medical is going on. And it could even be constipation, urinary tract infection, ur urine retention, all will cause a reaction in the body to, to essentially uh, result in, in a potential delirium. And any questions, comments? Yes, yes. So sure, if, if that's difficult, um, I, what a lot of, yeah, if, if that is difficult, so, so what she's asking, if somebody will not allow to take a urine sample, typically what a, I see a lot of GPs do is prescribe an antibiotic immediately. So if you, if you say, hey, this is going on, they'll give you the antibiotic immediately. If that, if that doesn't resolve, then, then they may try and take further measures. Go, going to the hospital, et cetera. Um, but usually the first instance, the GP will say, take these antibiotics, let's see if that resolves, and then we can look further into it. Um, I found it very helpful. I found it very helpful to have a set of dipsticks to do urine, urine tests myself. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, um, it's not impossible to obtain urine samples at the moment, but the very fact that the first time this happened, I had no idea what was going on, mm. and my wife had a UTI, mm -hmm. very simple to resolve. She resolved, her delirium resolved very quickly afterwards, mm -hmm. but when it first happened, I was massively scared. It was as if she'd fallen off a cliff. Mm -hmm. So after that, I kept urine sample sticks, and she knows why we've got them, and she's happy to be involved, <laughs> in our case, because she knows the consequences of having one is very great. And mm -hmm. then the GP instantly Mm -hmm. pre uh, can pre present uh, a solution to you rather than having to go through the test process. And, and I think once a pattern is established, or if it happens once, then you're more likely to be able to react a bit more quickly. Um, but, but it is about just knowing, okay, there's been a very sudden, acute, rapid change. There's something medical going on. And again, it could be an infection, constipation, medication interaction. So you want to think if any medication has changed recently, been added or taken away. Um, so, so quite complex process to think through what's going on, but it's, it's about ruling out what could potentially be causing the, the delirium. And I will say for hospitalization, if somebody goes home after being in the hospital for a long time, there may be some residual delirium that will take a while to resolve completely. So any other questions, comments? Yes. How do you get a doctor to talk to you on your own? Because I find with my husband's doctor, she refuses to talk to me on my own. Your husband must be here. Okay, okay. 
So I'm happy to answer questions about this uh, at lunch. So I'm getting the go move ahead signal, but I am very happy to discuss that because we, quite frankly, we have the same issue with GPs. They won't talk to us as a care provider a lot of the time. Um, sometimes I have to be really pushy about it and say, okay, I'm gonna, then I'm gonna call 999 because something's going on here. So um, I think it's just pulling, pulling levers and seeing which one works and then going with that. Um, so um, now what, what happens if you are going to the hospital? So <coughs> typically it, I've, I have found that people have a hard time asking for help. And so the, the most important thing if there is a medical issue going on is, is trying to get somebody that, that will be able to help you and, and don't try and manage it alone if you can avoid it. Um, tell the staff in the hospital about the dementia. Don't don't just go in and, and hand the reins over. Make sure that you're informing everybody involved in this hospital stay that there is a diagnosis of dementia. Be ready to explain symptoms le and events leading up to the hospitalization and ask questions. Don't just take it and say, okay, we're gonna be in the hospital for two weeks. See what can be done outpatient. Can see if any medi medications should or can be continued and any um, side effects if any um, if any procedures have to be done. So just, just having the right to ask as many questions as possible. Don't be afraid of people's time. That's what they're there for. Yes, people are rushing around, but you be really, really adamant about getting as much information as possible at that time. Being vocal, tell staff immediately if there's a change. Ask family and friends to help make calls. Ask the staff for more assistance, and again, ask any questions. I put that many times in the slide because I think it's really important to be empowered to ask questions. You're not gonna know everything. Be comfortable asking. Um, yes. Um, I don't think it's about asking questions. I think it's about sharing information yeah. because particularly relevant to this group, I mean, some of you may know, um, some of you may know Laurie and John who used to attend this group. Um, and John had PCA dementia, which, you know, of course, affects people's visual um, mm -hmm. vi vision. He, when he was hospitalized, um, he lost half a stone. And Laurie looked at his notes, and it said, refuse meal, refuse meal, refuse meal. Mm -hmm. They'd put the meal on his, tab on, his, um, on his tray. He hadn't been able to see his meal. He didn't know that the food was there. When she explained to the staff that PCA dementia means that parts of your um, visual centers are, are affected. Mm -hmm. They were absolutely astonished. They had no idea. They know about Alzheimer's, but they did not know about the rarer forms of dementia. And so she shared the information with them. So it should be a two-way street because they are, you know, with the best will in the world, hospital staff have very, very limited training about dementia. Mm -hmm. And the nurses have little. The healthcare assistants who do an awful lot of the actual hands-on caring in the hospital mm -hmm. context, even less. So it's really important to be sharing that information, not just asking questions. Precisely, and I think it's it's about establishing that that conversation with the hospital staff and and asking questions. What's what is what can we expect? And now here is the information that we have about how to make this easier for everyone. Yes. as PCA. Um, we unfortunately have had a lot of experience of her going as an emergency, mm -hmm. where there's precious little time for mm -hmm. people. And we've had some very bad experiences because the staff with the best will in the world do not know about how to treat Alzheimer's mm -hmm. or people with PCA mm -hmm. particularly. Just one example, they had to do a blood test on my wife and the person that was doing it had no idea of her condition put the needle in her arm and tried to take blood and she immediately pulled it out and there was blood everywhere and he was totally surprised. So that is a problem, mm -hmm. um, finding the staff in emergency, A&E, to help. Um, and the other problem is exactly as was said, when she went up into a ward, initially they, didn't, mm -hmm. they weren't able to cope with her and we had to spend most of our time in the ward. Um, it was only until the hospital mental health team, which you can ask for, intervened that mm -hmm. things got better. So once you make it 
but if you are going to a &E, once you go into the ward, there should be a discharge planner that you should ask to speak to immediately. And my advice is to identify who that person is immediately um, because their job is to help you get home safely and as quickly as possible. And so they should be the person that is giving that information over to the, the rest of the hospital staff. So the discharge planner is a key person in the hospital, and that's somebody who you should connect with as soon as possible. Um, so I guess we will we'll just jump to, to the next uh, next part of hospital discharge planning. So it, discharge planning does it starts right from the second you walk in the door. You want to identify who the discharge planner is, and it's about assessing your loved one's current and future needs. So meet the discharge planner immediately and tell them that you would like regularly planned discharge meetings because they are incredibly busy and they're not going to have the same amount of time for everyone. But in working with having discharge planning for individuals who have dementia, there's an extra layer of complexity around that and so they should be spending a lot more time thinking about what your needs are as, as a family and how to get your loved one home safely, uh, keyword safely. And so they should be agreeing to that discharge plan with yourselves. And so if you don't agree, if you don't feel that it's safe, it shouldn't be happening. And so getting your, what your expectations are communicated to the discharge planner is, is a key part of that process. Um, I saw a hand for a question. No? OK. So you, what you also want is contact information for the community team. So a lot of the time what happens is you get discharge from you get a discharge plan from the hospital and then you don't know who to contact about what is somebody coming for physiotherapy is a district nurse coming try and get a lot of that com contact information while you're in the hospital and arranging any follow-up care equipment and treatment potentially reablement so for people coming home from hospital they are entitled to reablement visits for up to six weeks and then it gets reevaluated establish all of that immediately before you leave the hospital because once you've left hospital it's very difficult to get that information retrospectively and then don't allow yourself to be pressured into going home sooner than you feel safe so the buzzword is unsafe discharge if you tell the ward that this is an unsafe discharge and that you are not in agreement with it they should not be sending your loved one home and what happens a lot of the time is if you are um, if you do live with the person that you're caring for they will try and make you feel pressured into taking that on yourself but that's absolutely not right you are entitled to support in that transition period and if you don't feel that what they're offering is adequate you can you can refuse to have somebody discharged from the hospital so just demand demand that attention and if you say this is an unsafe discharge i do not feel this is a safe discharge they should sit down with you and work out exactly why and plan around that and so unfortunately we've seen a, a big increase in unsafe discharges as a care provider recently um, where people have come home with the wrong medication the, the, the wrong paperwork the not right um, the equipment which isn't right people come home at one o'clock in the morning where things haven't been put in place. So unfortunately, it's settled down a bit, but the last sort of month or so, we've, we've seen a lot more unsafe discharges. So that's a real serious issue at the moment, as we've seen. Sorry. Okay. There we go. So um, as I was saying, you want to advocate for as much to be done in the hospital as you can. Once you leave the hospital, getting the community providers in can take a while. So if you can have that speech therapy assessment, occupational therapy assessment, physiotherapy assessment in the hospital, that is probably the, the best way to implement the care following at home. Most importantly, never, never, never leave without a copy, copy of that finalized discharge plan. The amount of times that people have come home not knowing what medications have been discontinued or what to do is absolutely shocking. So make sure that you walk out with a copy of that. And follow up with the GP to make sure that they've gotten a copy because sometimes you'll go home with a copy and then you'll call the GP and they never received that copy. So it's incredibly important just to verify that the GP has the same information that you have. So what that will entail is details about the admission, condition, medication, follow-up recommendations, and contact information, again, for the community team following that discharge. So that should be all on that discharge document. So it should be the roadmap of what's going to happen in the initial weeks in coming home. They will set arrangements for social and healthcare support, in, including informal supports like a lot of the support groups. 
and then details of other useful resources and services. So it should really, again, be a roadmap to helping you transition home following that hospitalization. But I really can't stress enough how important it is not to leave without a hard copy of that discharge form, because again, once you're home, getting that information can be quite difficult. Okay. Any questions about that? Yes. Could I just add to the um, list for the go back? packaging with, with all the details on there because I've learned that from bitter experience. Mm -hmm. And at least two days worth of supplies. And also, um, the, um, a lot of hospitals have specialist uh, care staff, you know, nurses to do with Parkinson's, for example, mm -hmm. dementia, admiral nurses. It's worth checking out with the, the hospital staff what's mm -hmm. available there. Thank, thank you. So, um, the, yep, this is just the go back contest. Would be happy to add that to it. So thank you. Right, well, I think we need to wrap up because yeah. Nikki's giving me the eyes and it's not and it's not the come to bed eyes. So um, <laughs> thank you very much. Sorry we went a bit over. Um, if you do have any questions, please come and find us and we, we will answer your questions after. Alexis and Matt will be around through lunch, so please do and go and speak to them about anything that came on the slides here. And we will circulate the slides afterwards. So thank you so much, Alexis and Matt, and thanks for all the contributions that you've put forward for this. Okay, so I'm now going to introduce you to the direct support team, so you'll know who you're emailing or phoning. Come here, girls. So you may have had emails from us, and when you um, on the website, when it does say if to email the team, just contact at Rare Dementia Support. That means us three. So it can either come to us separately or come together. So um, this is Claire. Hello. And this is Olivia. Hi. Claire's been with us since. Um, April? Yeah. April. And Olivia has really just brand started. New. She's brand yeah. spanking <laughs> new. So this is her uh, group. But we are here to answer any of your questions and to help you as much as we possibly can. So please keep them busy. <laughs> just, just wanting to put names to faces and to say these guys have got a lot of experience with Alzheimer's Society and other organisations um, of working with people trying to support them um, living with dementia. So, And also not only doing rare dementia support but also playing a vital role as part of the um, rare dementia support impact study evaluating the benefits of things like support and trying to improve and gather information about how we can best support people living with rare dementias. So thank you for joining the team. Um, I think now in the interest of time I can hear stomachs rumbling so there's lots of tasty sandwiches out there. The two uh, very brief reminders are that during lunch um, there are going to be um, the opportunities to speak to um, Emily and Emma about the Rare Dementia Support Impact Study, so about um, the questions you think we should be asking about um, the effectiveness of groups such as these and peer support in particular um, to, to try and share that practice and get more of groups like this around the country. Um, uh, my, Elaine's here from Mind for You to talk about, I believe, um, supporting people to go on holiday um, when they're living with a rare dementia. And also Anna and Alexis are here from the National Brain Appeal. So they'll all be at t small tables uh, just through in the lunch area if you'd like to talk with them. And finally, a brief reminder that we'll start uh, in the mind of, uh, mindful of the time, we'll start back at quarter past one, not at one, with the opportunity to take part in two of these uh, five small group discussions, so broadly around legal issues, person-centered approaches and support, uh, clinical questions, uh, information about research and clinical trials, and about speech and communication. So while you're eating your sandwiches, if you would mind pondering which group you'd like to go to, um, four of the groups will be um, back through uh, with round tables and signs marking them, and the, the trials and research um, discussion will be in here. Um, so we'll start those at 1.15. And then your hosts for those little discussions after half an hour will enable you to um, move on to a different group if you'd like to. Sorry. Oh, yes, sorry. And the final, the sixth option I forgot to mention, sorry, the glass room at the back. If you don't want to take part in any of those discussions or halfway through you decide it's not for you, that's absolutely fine. There's, the glass room at the back is just for informal chatting, totally private conversations, no structure. You facilitate yourselves if that's what you would like to do. But anyway, for now... Please come and have some lunch. <laughs>